When I say good orchestrator, who pops into your head? Maybe it's one of the French Impressionists, Maurice Ravel, Claude Debussy, Nadia or Lily Boulanger, or maybe it's someone recognized for the orchestration of a particular piece of theirs rather than their orchestration in general. People like Gustav Holst with The Planets, Igor Stravinsky with The Rite of Spring, and Hector Berlioz with Symphony Fantastique. Maybe I didn't guess who you thought of because there are so many great orchestrators out there, but you know who I'm willing to bet you didn't think of? Mozart, or anyone born before around 1800, really. Now, this isn't because Mozart was a bad orchestrator or anything, but because before the Romantic era in Europe, orchestration was much more about function and utility. It was about what certain instruments not only could, but should do in an orchestra. There was not nearly as much perceived uniqueness to be had across different composers in their orchestration, aside from the occasional innovation or gimmick. But over the course of the Romantic era in Europe, orchestration became much more about exploration, cleverness, and effect, which paved the way for the composers that we know because of their orchestration. But I don't think that this change in values is often reflected in the way that orchestration is taught, and I think that people often conflate orchestration with instrumentation. They're two very tightly knit ideas, is, but they're not the same thing. Instrumentation is all about what an instrument can do. What the playable range is, what the different registral characteristics are, what's idiomatic versus unidiomatic, and generally common practices with regard to how people write for the instrument. With orchestration, again, it seems like the composers whose orchestration we highly value, that value is placed on how clever the composer can be with the forces that are at their disposal, how unique of sounds they can create with different combinations of instruments and effects, and generally being exploratory with what is possible. These are things that I value too. And it's what made starting to write for orchestra so exciting, and it still is. Once I had a really solid foundation in instrumentation through years of trial and error, through several terrible high school pieces, as well as studying Adler's orchestration manual, spending time in orchestration online, and of course spending time in orchestras themselves, every new score became like a vast open sea with so many incredible things waiting to be explored. I will never ever forget the sheer joy I had when writing my Symphony Number no. 1 and deciding that the second theme of the first movement would be introduced by the vibraphone with only clarinets and bassoons as an accompaniment because that's just what felt right to my soul in that moment. And that's such a small and almost silly thing, but the first few orchestra pieces I wrote were filled with moments like that where I was just elated to be empowered with the ability to make those choices. And of course there was and still is a ton of the learning process to be had. Not everything worked out as I had thought it would with every orchestration decision I made, but I at least had the comfort that I was making really deliberate choices. Instead of scoring in a way that was almost prescriptive where the low instruments hold down the bass note of the chord while the seconds and violas give some accompaniment and the first violins give the melody because that's just the way it goes, I was finally orchestrating meaningfully. And so that's a lot of why I wanted to make this video was to sort of give a reminder of why we even talk about orchestration. The reason I really like making those orchestration minute videos, which I'm sure some of you have seen, is because it allows me to hold a microscope to certain textures or musical happenings and point out like, hey, this is something that I think is really cool. And if you also think that it's cool, then this breakdown might be useful for you. The point is not to be like, oh, look how William Grant still combines these horns with these clarinets. Everyone should do that always. And anyone who doesn't do that is an idiot. It's not like I think that every climactic moment needs to have a xylophone or that every middle movement of a concerto needs to be a chamber piece. It's to show off some instances in which I think composers were either being really creative or really clever. Like the Florence Price one where the flutes and oboes are doubled on this like descending chromatic scale thing and so it shifts from being a flute dominant sound to an oboe dominant sound over the course of the scale. Like that's really cool. And even if you don't wind up using that in your own work, maybe it will inspire something similar. So that's what I want to encourage in this video is to explore and to try and be creative in orchestration because that's what makes it fun. It's no fun at all to sit there trying to figure out if your stuff is standard enough. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, that's certainly something that I want to do and try to do, but it just doesn't end up working out. I have a few thoughts and also some resources to share with you. Firstly, if you don't have a really good foundation in instrumentation, it can be really, really difficult to feel empowered to make creative orchestration decisions. If you want to improve your knowledge of instrumentation, Samuel Adler's study of orchestration is a really great resource resource for that. And even cooler is that not only does it spend time talking about individual instruments, but as the name might imply, it also spends a significant amount of time exploring different ideas in orchestration, and it's really, really helpful. Another one that I mentioned earlier is the Orchestration Online Facebook group. Again, the folks in there are happy to answer any questions about instrumentation and orchestration. And Thomas Goss, who runs the group as well as the whole 
Orchestration Online website and YouTube channel, is a fantastic and very friendly and approachable educator and creator. And of course, as always, studying smaller works for specific instruments is a great way to learn about them. But maybe the problem isn't that you feel that you're lacking in orchestration knowledge, but rather you find yourself gravitating toward doing the same things you always do when you're orchestrating. This happens to me a lot, and the way that I deal with it is by setting particular challenges for myself every time I start a new piece. When I did the Lily Boulanger orchestration challenge in 2020, I remember specifically deciding for myself that I was going to use triple woodwinds, which is something I had never done before. Starting my symphony number two was similar, where I decided I was going to use piccolo, bass clarinet, contrabassoon, and piano in an original orchestral work of mine. And in the second movement of that same piece, I explicitly decided to use only strings, brass, and a handful of percussion instruments, which is sort of an odd thing to do, but I think it resulted in an interesting chunk of music, and I think people will notice it, particularly when woodwinds return in the third movement. Just little things like that. There are other kinds of checks that I have in place as well. There's a great feature in Sibelius and Dorico and Not Finale where you can go in and look at the individual parts of the piece that you're writing. I'll occasionally scroll through the individual parts as I'm writing a piece, and if any one instrument or group of instruments has a really boring or samey part, I can decide, okay, in the next 32 bars or however long, I need to give these folks something interesting to do. Meeting interest quotas in your orchestral parts doesn't always work out, but at the very least, if you come to a point where you're trying to figure out what to do next, it can at least guide your decision making. One last thing that I'll add is that I often find that I orchestrate with much more deliberation when I'm sketching orchestral music. I think at some point I'll have an entire video on how to effectively sketch music in the future, so stay tuned for that. But for now, I'll just say that it's much easier for me to be deliberate when I can look at just a handful of staves and write a line and be like, oh yeah, that's definitely going in the flute part, and I can just decide that right then and there. So, could be something to experiment with. Anyway, I want to know what your thoughts are. Who's your favorite orchestrator and why? And what are some strategies that you employ to keep your orchestral music fresh? And also let me know about any challenges that you have with writing orchestral music. I would love to hear what your experience is. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that this was at least thought provoking. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing. It means a lot. Thank you very much and I'll see you soon.